Greetings students, Mr. Little here. And on this History Bite, we're gonna look at chapter 22, part one, the origins of the age of exploration. By the end of this History Bite, you should be able to answer the two following questions. How did forces and groups outside of Europe contribute to the causes of the age of exploration? And how did technology interact with economic, social, and political changes and lead to the age of exploration? So notice I didn't say European age of exploration, and that is because it really, this, this time period of around 1200 to 1600, maybe 1700, really ought to be thought of as sort of a global age of exploration. Europeans were not the only ones going out and doing settling and exploring. For example, the Polynesians are known to have settled Hawaii uh, sometime in the 12th century or the 13th century. And at some point after that, although we don't know when or where, uh, individuals from these Polynesian settlements uh, at some point interacted with or met individuals from South America. Um, and this had long been theorized. It had long been believed that some sort of pre-Columbian Pacific meeting had occurred, um, in part because the sweet potato, uh, which is native to South America, was being widely grown in uh, Polynesia and the Polynesian islands by the time Europeans arrived. So it was long theorized and recently confirmed that, in fact, there was some pre-Columbian Pacific meeting of individuals. There's also the legend of the ruler of Mali, Mansa Abu Bakari Kita II. Um, legend, according to legend and one particular source, um, in 1340, he built a gigantic fleet and had it sail down the Niger River and then had it go west. Um, what happened to it? Did it ever come back? What did it find? We don't know. Um, the only source, we only have one source that testifies to this. Um, but even whether the fleet did or did not exist, um, it shows that definitely people around the world were thinking about exploring during this time. And of course, I don't also need to mention, I've already talked a little bit about the Ming Dynasty's Zheng He voyages, uh, which were not strictly exploration, but nonetheless demonstrate another example of sort of seafaring, adventuring, uh, or using the seas to expand political authority that we see during this time. So let's talk a little bit about the technology that makes the age of exploration possible. Sometimes people ask, why didn't Europeans sail to America sooner? Um, why didn't Columbus happen in like, you know, 800? Or why didn't the Romans make it to America, right? Um, well, part of the reason was that there was a technological element that needed to be um, brought up to speed, if you will. There were just some technological issues that, um, that Europeans at the time didn't have under their, um, didn't have mastery of. And what they did get, however, over the course of the Middle Ages, over the course of the late Middle Ages, was Europeans increasingly interacted with the Islamic world in ways they had not previously. And because of this, a number of technologies and a lot of knowledge, specifically mathematical and astronomical knowledge, came to Europe from either the Crusades or a series of places we call the translation movement in uh, Sicily, Malta, and in Spain. So specifically astronomical charts that helped sailors plot where they were, the Latin sail, which helped sailors steer their boat more effectively, and the astrolabe, which is sort of like medieval GPS. It would tell you where you were in the night sky. It's an incredible device. Um, all of these things came into the European world from the Islamic world over the course of um, many hundreds of years. Sometimes it's very precise, like the translation movement in Spain. We know exactly when, like the Alphonsine tables were translated from Arabic into Spanish. Uh, but some things were a little more gradual, like the astrolabe was more of a gradual introduction. And we don't have an exact date uh, for when the astrolabe was introduced. Um, there was also uh, technology and information that came from uh, uh, further east in Asia. And this mostly came via the Mongols. And their two greatest contributions were gunpowder, uh, which would later be used in European cannons that allowed them to control trade, as well as the compass, uh, which would allow uh, Europeans to know what direction they were going in. And so the compass and the astrolabe um, together made it somewhat of an unstoppable force, if you will, in terms of uh, European exploration. However, that's not to say that Europeans themselves did not also um, develop new technologies and improve upon existing technologies in order to make it possible. So, for example, one of the most important things that people um, usually overlook is the fact that the Europeans were one of the first ones to put cannons on their ships, actual um, cannons, gunpowder cannons on their ships. And part of the reason they could do this is because Although the cannon was introduced to Europe via Asia, um, it, you widely believe to have been through the Ottoman Turks or the Mongols. 
Um, Europeans themselves improved upon it and improved upon it because of the constant internecine warfare between European states. And historians cite the Hundred Years' War between England and France, where when looking at paintings of the war, you can, you can see cannons getting smaller, uh, you can see them getting more effective. Uh, and so this, this improvement of the cannon really allowed Europeans to up their naval game. But you also have the design of new ships, like the Flut in the, in the Netherlands, the Karak, and the Caravel in Portugal. And these ship types were uh, a combination of royal sponsorship by uh, rulers such as Prince Henry the Navigator, or sometimes Prince Henry the Crusader, or sometimes Prince Henry the Slaver, uh, depending on how you're talking about him. Um, but also, like the Flucht, which was the Dutch ship, um, was a, a commercial ship. And so they wanted to build a bigger ship, specifically so they could carry more stuff. And so um, technology, as we can already see, is sort of interacting with economic demands right now. But also, Europeans made some knowledge-based discoveries of their own, such as a series of winds called the Volta do Mar, which blow off the coast of what is now Portugal and Spain. And they allow you to sail down the coast of Africa and then and you could sail out into the Atlantic Ocean and they would blow back north up to uh, up to Spain and Portugal. And so these wind systems allowed uh, Europeans to travel down Africa and then back in relative safety. Um, it had long been feared that if you traveled too far down the coast of Africa, you'd fall off the, fall off the world or that there was uh, it was too hot to live. Some ancient Greeks had theorized that uh, south of a certain point, uh, south of a certain cape in Africa, it was it was too hot to exist. So they had all this technology now, right? What about their motivations? Why would they want to, um, to risk their lives and go out, right? Well, there was a couple of really key reasons. One is, and particularly for Portugal and Spain, um, was that the crusading spirit, if you will, was still strong. Portugal and Spain, unlike the other European powers, had really forged their national identities on doing battle with the Muslims that lived in Portugal and Spain. Um, and so they continued, even after the fall of Granada in 1492, uh, to kind of wage war against um, the North African Muslim states, particularly Morocco, but also some of the other ones. Um, and the, what is usually considered by Europeans to be the first uh, or considered by historians to be the first example of European expansion outside of Europe um, that would be part of the age of, of exploration and later colonization and then later imperialism was the Battle of Ceuta in 1415, in which Prince Henry led a force of Portuguese knights into Ceuta, which is off the coast of Morocco, and uh, took control of the city. And even though he got very rich from all the trade goods he captured in Ceuta, he really saw himself as sort of crusading. And there's a lot of very dramatic paintings of of Prince Henry as a crusader, uh, defeating the Muslims in Ceuta. Um, there was also kind of attached to that, but a little bit different. Uh, there was the desire to find this legendary king of Africa called Prester John, uh, who was somewhere in East Africa, devout Christian, and he would have this massive army that would help the Europeans in a new crusade against the Muslims, and they could, you know, defeat defeat the Islamic world from two sides, one from Europe and one from Africa. Uh, it's very likely, the Prester John myth went through a lot of variation and evolution, but it's probably based on the fact that Europeans were vaguely aware that at one point there had been a Christian state somewhere in Eastern Africa, and they were right. That was Aksum, later Ethiopia, which did exist, um, and Europeans would eventually make contact with, but wouldn't be able to help them in a new crusade. But we'll talk more about that when we get there. And then there were simple political goals, um, which is that, for example, the kings of Spain uh, saw themselves as the protectors of Christianity. And so for them in particular, it was very important to spread the religion. Uh, this was part of the justification for why they were kings and queens in the first place, was that they would spread and protect the Christian religion. So Queen Isabella, as you may know, made Christopher Columbus uh, super duper promise that he would convert all the natives to Christianity when he got to wherever he was going. Um, and so spreading Christianity was a major political goal for the, the rulers of Spain and the rulers of Portugal. Um, however, later rivals to the Iberians, that Spain and Portugal, such as the English and the Dutch, um, th their political goals in sponsoring voyages of exploration were simply to outmaneuver the Portuguese and uh, the Spanish. They wanted somebody to get, get around them, like we got to find a way to break their hold on the trade. Got to find a way to get around them. So there was definitely politics when we talk about motivations for exploration. We should also note that there was a strong economic uh, 
pr uh, profit motive, if you will. And this is much stronger with uh, the Portuguese than it was with the Spanish. I think you could make the case. Um, and the Portuguese and the Spanish both had experience um, coloni colonizing before, even before the voyages of Columbus. So in 1419 and 1427, uh, they had discovered the islands of Madeira and the Canaries and Portugal colonized Madeira and Spain colonized the Canaries. And on both of these islands, um, what we call the plantation model, which actually had its roots in Cyprus and even before then in what is now uh, Syria and, and Lebanon during the Crusades, they developed uh, something of a slave labor plantation model. And initially they used the natives of the Canary Islands called the Guanches, but then they also imported Jews who they had expelled from Spain uh, for refusing to convert to Christianity. And they began to uh, raid the coast of Africa to, to get slaves to work on their plantations. And some historians have made the case that at this point in history, um, Europeans began to look at uh, Africans as as um, those to be enslaved. That this is sort of where we get some of our modern conceptions of what it means to be black, if you will. Um, it was the the rating for slaves for these plantations on these islands just off the coast of Africa, uh, pre Columbus and uh, pre fourteen ninety two. So a couple of major explorers to note and keep track of. Uh, Vasco da Gama was a Portuguese sailor who sailed around the coast of Africa after Columbus, but he's the one that made it possible to get around the coast of Africa to India. He was the first European that we know of to sail around the coast of Africa. And while ostensibly he was there to trade, it's worth noting that he... Um, bombarded a number of cities with his cannons, that, you know, those cannons we talked about earlier, uh, when they would not trade with him, most famously Calicut and some of the Swahili city-states, who when they would not do business with him, he said, okay, I'll just, I'll bomb you, I'll just blow you up. So um, not the nicest guy, has kind of a negative reputation for that. Uh, we also have the famous Ferdinand Magellan, who while he was, um, uh, he was working for uh, the crown of, uh, of Spain. Uh, he managed to sail around the world. Um, his crew sailed around the world, I should say, not him. He was killed in the Philippines when he sought to kind of get in the middle of a local civil war. Um, so his crew, uh, a small fraction of them, did manage to make it all the way back um, to Spain. And then you have Captain James Cook, who is famous for discovering, or at least being the first one to make very clear where Australia was, um, as well as a number of Pacific islands. He's also very famous for getting killed by natives. Uh, in Hawaii, he attempted to interfere um, with a local ritual, and also his sailors had been behaving really badly, and the Hawaiians were not terribly happy about all this, and there was a skirmish, and he was killed. So if some of these major explorers tell you anything is that the life of an explorer could be very short and uh, the locals were not always very happy to see. So you should be able to answer those two questions from the beginning of the History Bite.